And so we're going to take just a few minutes to get to know our panelists. And like I said, we might be uh, joined by a couple more um, or not, but uh, we'll have some fun and, uh, and we'll just uh, hopefully come out of here learning a lot of, a lot of new things. So why don't we start? With you, Andrea. With me. Do we stand there? Uh, I yeah. think these are on. Are these on? Yeah, you can Test. hear me? Yes. Um, hi there, um, everybody. It's good um, to be here in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm Andrea Williams. I'm the Chief Executive of Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Center, um, organizations based back in the United Kingdom. I have the great honor of having received an award here at the World Congress of Family as the Woman of the Year for the Family, which is uh, a great honor uh, to me. So I should be carrying around my little, um, my little plaque um, on that. But um, what should I say about me? Well, I think I'll just give you my testimony, as it were, so you do know who's up here. And I go right back to the um, beginning. Um, I'm born to an Italian father and an English mother. My father came over from Italy to the United Kingdom in the 1960s. And he met my mother. And uh, she was just 16. And he was eight years older when they were married. And I came along at seven, when she was 17. And the reason why I say that in this context is that I often think, I was born in 1965, so I'm 50 this year, and I think that um, the fact that that kind of situation, um, a young woman being pregnant at that, at that sort of stage, in that situation with my father was a waiter at the time, uh, and just the pressures that would have been upon them, um, and the fact that something like abortion, for instance, would never have even entered their head. And the whole, so the whole concept of kind of, um, it's, just, it's just really dawned on me just the kind of how un unlikely and unusual that situation was back there in the 1960s and the fact that I was born then. But also that then correlated with um, uh, what next happened is that neither of them had faith. My father had been put in a seminary uh, to go to um, school as the youngest of 10 children to become a priest. And he said, I went out into a piazza. I caught the eye of a pretty woman. I was no priest. And so, um, as I say, he came across to England, married my mum. Neither one of them had faith, at an age, but at age four, I was put on a bus to go to Sunday school. And there, Mrs. Hibbs told me all about Jesus. And I fell in love with Jesus, aged four, at Sunday school. At age seven, Mrs. Hicks, uh, the next, not Mrs. Hibbs, but Mrs. Hicks, the next Sunday school teacher said that the best present I could ever have was a Bible and to read it every day. And almost from that day to this, I've read my Bible um, every single day. I say this because I think that one of the most precious things that we can do is to keep hold of our children, is to, raise, to, to, to teach them in the ways that they should go. So Sunday school is really uh, important. When I was aged about eight, I was at home from Sunday school and I watched a program, I was at home from school, and I watched a program on the television called Crown Court, a program about uh, cases that took place in the courtroom. And I said to my mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a barrister. That's an attorney who is an advocate attorney. I'm going to be a barrister, and I'm never going to change my mind. You know, that's the English ones that wear the wig and gown. That's me, yeah? I prayed that night um, on my basil brush carpet by my bed. I prayed that night. And my usual prayer, God bless mum, God bless dad, God bless Sam the cat, amen. And then, and dear Lord Jesus, if it is your will, please may I pass the 11 plus so that I can go to grammar school, so that I can become a barrister. And that little girl prayed that prayer every single day. And I was granted the answer to my prayer. I was able to go to the selected school, the grammar school. Um, I went on. Um, I went to university. I studied law and Italian at the University of Wales and the University of Pisa, and then to the Inns of Court School of Law in London. And there um, I uh, did my bar finals and I practiced criminal and family law. And it was during that time, this is now the late 80s, early 90s, that I began to see that the human rights system that was, being re was replacing our common law system, dating right back to the Magna Carta, rooted in biblical values, the human rights system was beginning to meet, mean that we were having competing rights in the public space, in the legal space. And we found that Christians were beginning to lose their jobs. Um, Christian uh, unions were being chucked out of uh, 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 universities. 
people were beginning to um, lose their jobs for offering as nurses for offering prayers to patients and I began to represent these clients and so um, I've spent um, all of my professional life lobbying into Parliament um, on life on marriage on the family and taking hundreds of cases through my organization um, to promote free the uh, Christian freedoms now this afternoon just as I was coming in here, um, I've been dealing with a journalist who's been here. May even be, I don't know if he's, Lester, are you here in this room? I don't suppose you would admit it if, even if you were. Is anyone, is Lester here? Um, let me just uh, give you a little bit of what's going on when you're in this public space. Um, Your comments came to mind, your comments in Jamaica. So I was uh, in Jamaica, I, um, I went to Jamaica and talked about the um, sort of sexual revolution, what had happened in the United Kingdom. After WCF distanced itself from Rafael Cruz's remarks linking LGBT activists and paedophilia, which I reported in, in this story yesterday. This morning I asked WCF interim director Douglas Slark and Alison Carson about how to square their position on Mr. Cruz's remarks. I'm doing a story more broadly, and I want to ask you, do you believe that LGBT movement seeks to legalize paedophilia? Well, I've never said that directly in that way, but that's how he's interpreting what I want to say. Are you still urging activists outside Europe to speak about that? And does WCF distancing itself from this line of argument, which they're not exactly doing, but that's what he's trying to make, trying to drive a wedge between us, um, against that pro-life advocates in places like the US is becoming more cautious about how they push back against the LGBT movement. So this is a kind of trap that he's trying to lay. I then send him back uh, a quote, basic, uh, a fairly generic quote, saying um, that I'm here to push back against the elitist sexual agenda and celebrate the beauty and the hope that is found in the natural family. And then he sends, comes right back to me. Well, now I'm thoroughly confused. I assume you're withdrawing your accusation that I misquoted you or distorted your comments based on the recording. So you are now disavowing your comments in Jamaica or does this suggest you are comfortable saying something to a foreign audience, uh, something you would not say in the US or the UK? So that's been going on just as I was coming into this room. I think that was a bit garbled for you all, but do you get the gist? Do you get the gist of what happens when you stand up in the public space and you, speak to, you seek to advocate on behalf of life, on the beauty of all life from the moment of conception to the point of natural death? on the beauty of marriage that is between a man and a woman, and when you expose the radical sexual elite that would seek to destroy that. And just as you do that, you will find yourself watched, you will find yourself misquoted, you will find yourself lied about. Thank you. Congratulations on your award as well. That's, that's amazing. We're going to go down the line for our new panelists. Um, we're just going to give you a little bit to uh, explain uh, who you are and what you're passionate about, what your work is. And, uh, and, and we'll just take a couple minutes for each of you. And then uh, you can uh, start texting your questions in as you get to know the panelists anytime. And uh, that'll allow us to launch in right uh, as we're done with the introductions. All right. Um, my name is Vince. And uh, I arrived in Salt Lake City um, via my parents. They came here to ski from Michigan. And, uh, and they never left. And, uh, and being that that is how they arrived and seeking powder and, uh, and skiing, um, I grew up skiing. I love skiing. Um, I love Salt Lake. Uh, I love this valley. Um, born and raised here. And um, uh, I grew up in a Christian home. And um, in my teenage years, junior high, high school, um, walked very far away from my faith um, and, uh, experimented in, in lots of different drugs and in a lifestyle that was very contrary to, um, to the way that, uh, I always grew up, um, uh, and told that, uh, it was an important way to live. Um, and, uh, and through a lot of heartache and a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges in my life have, uh, since returned. And I spend, um, uh, all of my time and effort and resource pouring into young people in this valley. Um, I, uh, I mentor and care for teenagers um, all across the valley um, who some are in trouble, some are, um, uh, some are not in trouble, and, and I hope to, to help them stay that way. 
Um, I, uh, I have a loving mom and a loving father that uh, are divorced. Um, I have two sisters. Um, the oldest is, uh, is gay um, and, uh, and was just married uh, to, her, to her wife, I guess. And so I have an interesting perspective there where, uh, where someone very close to me um, is a practicing homosexual. And, um, and yet I, I try my, uh, my best to uphold um, and to exactly the way that, and to support her the way that Jesus would support her um, by loving her and yet um, not compromising on truth, uh, biblical truth of, of what God's word says. Um, and, uh, and so as I, as I look at my life and the things that I've gone through, um, it's, uh, it's interesting the people that God will put in my path um, to help uh, mentor them and to help them as they uh, grow and go through puberty and have confusing times in life and try to figure out uh, who they are and, and, and what they're going to become. Um, and so I believe that God has uh, put me in a spot where I can speak truth into uh, this next generation. And uh, it's, it's been an honor. My name is uh, Chad Jacobson, and I am a minister. We moved to Salt Lake about eight years ago, and we started uh, a non-denominational evangelical church here. Uh, and that time, the church has grown, and uh, we are actively involved in the community uh, in a lot of different levels and uh, a lot of different areas. We're working with uh, people who have extreme need and uh, who really do need uh, to experience the love of Christ in a uh, uh, in a very real and sometimes tangible way. Uh, I grew up in a uh, pastor's home. My dad was a minister. Uh, I'm adopted. My birth parents uh, were very young. Uh, my mother was 15 years old when she had me. My dad was 16. Uh, I was adopted as a child and raised uh, by my parents. And uh, it gives an interesting perspective uh, to people who uh, often or sometimes will think that, gosh, she someone else's life is perfect or everything in their life has gone uh, just the way that it needed to to, uh, to really make their life great. And it, it's interesting to see how God uses all the different, uh, all our different histories uh, to put us in the place that he wants us to be. Uh, and so that carries over into our ministry. We realize that God does have people on a journey. Uh, sometimes that journey is ugly and uh, it's a little bit difficult to walk through, uh, but uh, those are the times when real life change can happen, uh, and, uh, and it's exciting to be a part of the community in that way. And so, yeah, that's, I guess, the best introduction that I can give. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steve Fallon. I'm a Director of Mission Communications for Human Life International. Can you hear me? We're based in Front Row, Virginia, at the outer ring of the D.C. suburbs. Beautiful Shenandoah Valley, in Virginia. Uh, anybody been there? Nice. Right, if you know where Christian College is, it's not too far from there. Uh, what we do at Human Life International is we have partners in over 80 countries around the world. We've been to practically every country, some that don't even exist anymore, over the last 30 years, starting pro-life and pro-family movements in these countries. We're founded by Father Paul Marx, who was who uh, John Paul II, the Pope, called the Apostle of Life and told him he was doing the greatest work on earth. So really great to have a Pope be so supportive of pro-life and pro-family movements. It's a great thing. Um, what's, what I do for HLI is a variety of things. I, I consider myself a translator, not of language, but of what I call smarty pants ideas to regular folk talk. And uh, actually, that was, that was a really bad way of saying it for someone who's supposed to be a writer. I like I, I take the research and and a lot of people you've heard the great researchers over here in, in both ballrooms both in both these settings amazing folks who often can't uh, you know talk to real people in a way that everybody can understand so you need translators like myself um, so I, I try to get published I try to get our writers out there in different places around the world um, we, we we have been published around the world we focus mainly where our audience is which is in the U S since it's the, it's the U S that is exporting these evils of contraception, abortion, the redefinition of marriage, this whole, I think we were calling it the, the, uh, the rotten fruit of the sexual revolution is coming from the U.S. primarily, 
we think it's part of our obligation to stop. So where we're most busy is in uh, southeastern Asia, uh, Africa. Certainly, I have many uh, partners in the fleet there doing amazing things. I, I think Africa is going to kick a lot of butt, and I think a lot of us are going to be looking to Africa for leadership in the next 10 years. Uh, so it's a great, the, the church is amazingly strong there. Um, and I produced three documentaries, uh, Philippines, Central and Eastern Europe, um, and Central America. The last one we're working on now, we're halfway through it. If anybody has an extra 100000 <laughs> please, Steve Phelan, HLI, I'll give you a card. Um, that, and this one is uh, looking into stories that we've heard from Africa. We've been there that women are being harmed by, you know, Depo Provera, Norplant, these things. You get these drugs in America, and you're given all these warnings and, and everything else. A lot of them are actually restricted or banned in America. Not so in Africa. The same people who can't sell them here do sell them there. They sell them to American companies who give them without warning to African women, who all of a sudden wonder why they're not less poor six months later like they, told they, like they were told they would be, but that their bodies are starting to do things that they weren't told were going to happen. So we're hearing these stories. We want, we've started to tell the stories. That's, that's our next project. And uh, so I, I'm blessed to be able to do work that uh, I think a lot of us are trying to do internationally and to try to smack around the bad guys a little bit uh, in, a, in, a, in the sense of charity and, uh, and trying to help people understand the truth where, where love and truth intersect. I mean, that's what we're really trying to tell the story about. So uh, that's me. My name is Betty Ackerman, and I'm from Indiana. I have nine biological children, and the last one we adopted from Guatemala. We began homeschooling in 1986 before it was legal, so we went involved with the homeschool movement and getting it legalized across the country. And most recently, my husband and I have been married for almost 36 years. We have written and um, been a part of several marriage seminars. Um, we've particularly put a lot of emphasis into the issue of narcissism and the way that it affects our culture and particularly the devastating effect that it has on our families. And so that's pretty much where, where my focus is at. It's to be proactive in looking at the, the difficulties that are facing even Christian families and trying to proactively address those issues. And, um, you know, marriage doesn't have just an easy answer, and some of you may not be married, but you probably will be. And so marriage is, is the, the glue that holds our, our society together, and we believe that it's really important that we invest in the lives of, of young people that are married, and even people that have been married for 25 and 30 years that are contemplating getting a divorce, because at that point they think they've tried everything and nothing works. So I'm glad to be here, and look forward to your questions. Thank you for your uh, questions. Keep them coming in. We're going to start, and I'm going to ask the panel to try to keep your answers uh, as, as brief um, as you can uh, while still answering the question as straightforward as you can. Um, we're going to start with Andrea, and then, uh, and then if, if any of the other panel has anything to say about it. But this is um, specifically, um, being from the UK, here's the question, being from the UK, as you watch what is happening in the U.S. with family and gay marriage, what influence or message do you feel it is giving to the rest of the world? Um, I think that in the United Kingdom, we're actually ahead of you. Um, and, um, but you're in the United States, and you, but you're following very fast behind. And I think that we have a duty as the two nations that in many ways have led the world um, in f for freedom, for family, for faith. Both of our nations are founded on Christian precepts and Christian principles, but we've abandoned those principles. And as a result, our nations are now very sad and in rapid um, decline. But the sad our influence is disproportionate across the globe, and many people look to us for best practice and for best um, principles. So I think it's very serious uh, what has happened to us, and I think those of us that love, love God uh, in, in our nations that love Jesus Christ must um, call out to God's people and seek a return um, to him. But I think, I think it's very serious. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Pastor Chad um, on this one. 
when articulating our support for pro-family issues in the public square, should we explain the theological or worldview basis for our position, or should we communicate our position in purely secular terms? Uh, well, I can give you my opinion. Uh, if you're a person of faith, my faith defines who I am. So I can't begin to articulate my position uh, on anything without first looking to what my opinion or where my opinion comes from, and that comes from my faith. And so for me personally, uh, I, I don't know how you separate those two. Uh, certainly you can, you can speak a secular language, uh, but I think, without, uh, I think without the foundation of faith in that argument, I think we miss a great opportunity. Uh, a great opportunity to explain uh, with love uh, why we believe what we believe or why you believe what you believe. And as I look at the Bible, the Bible lists two things as sacred, and those are life and sexuality. Uh, and so for me personally, uh, I can't do something that is contrary to what I find in Scripture as being sacred. Uh, and that's the basis of all, any argument or any conversation I would have uh, as a person of faith uh, with anyone dealing with issues uh, like we have to deal with today. Very good. Can I get a communications point of view from, from you, Steve, especially by being out east? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, we're, we're also a group. Human Life International is also a group <clears throat> that we wear our faith on our sleeve, and there's something a little dishonest if we don't about us and our, our approach if we don't bring to bear all the weapons, so to speak, that we have, these weapons of peace, these weapons of, of joy, these weapons of truth. So that's, that, I have to agree, there's, it doesn't make <coughs> sense entirely. It wouldn't be honest for us to do that. That, there is so much science. Um, Miriam Grossman was talking about the biology that points to authentic masculinity, authentic femininity. Uh, the, the social science that points to the true flourishing of children and families. The, the research that's now coming out about what happens to people um, epidemiologically in, who live the LGBT lifestyle, and STIs and everything else. Truth and faith rhyme. Does that make sense? They intersect. Um, that we also make our case in a faith-based in, in faith way is I think a fuller way of making the entire case. If somebody can't hear that, then by the way, here's, here's what actually happens to a person's body who lives this lifestyle for a long time. So to me, it, the answer is you know, faith or secular, the answer is yes. Good. This is for Vince. Uh, and this is a, in a personal nature, so, so answer, uh, answer it the best way you can. And, and uh, it was actually several questions came in. Um, so I'm going to read it all, and then you can um, then you can take it from there. Um, some some of this uh, you might be able to answer, um, uh, but just do your best. Uh, first question is: uh, Was your sister always gay? Is she still a Christian after that? How did your family deal with that? And then. second. You know what, let's, let's leave it at that one, because that, that's, a, that's a good place to stop. I might ask a follow-up. Go for it. All right, well, I'm going to start with uh, how my family dealt with that. Um, our family as a whole um, supports my sister, loves my sister, cares for my sister, um, but um, we've, we've never um, compromised uh, what we believe to be true. Um, and so we've had conversations. Um, and, uh, you know, when she told me um, that, that she was gay, uh, the way that she did it was she, she, I, she was living out of state and I was visiting and she was showing me her home. And, 
and showing me where, where her room was. And then, you know, she showed me the second bedroom and this was the studio. Um, and, uh, you know, as of before that, it was her and her roommate were living there. And so after the tour, I said, so, so you and your roommate live in the same room? And she said, yes. And so I said, okay, so this means that, that you're gay? And, and she said, yes. <laughs> um, and so then I started asking some questions to her um, and uh, a conversation uh, started there that, that where, where I defended my, my belief and she understood my belief because she grew up um, in the same home that I did, going to the same church that I did and having the same belief system that I did. And so um, she understood my stance. And I, I think that's a really good, uh, it was good for us. Uh, to be able to, for her to be able to understand me, I think lots of times um, it, it's hard for them, for, so, for someone that, that has that sexual preference to understand um, a Christian point of view. And luckily, uh, my sister does have that understanding. Um, but uh, it was, it was as far as a, our, our family, we were surprised. Um, we were, we were sad, um, and uh, continue to be. But yet, we love her unconditionally. Um, and uh, that doesn't stop and that won't stop. Um, she's still very much a part of the family, uh, very much welcome, uh, and, uh, and, and that's understood. Um, and, uh, and she knows where we stand and we know where she stands and we pray for her all the time. Um, was she always gay? Um, it's a tough question. Um, you get into the territory of, you know, were you born this way? Um, and here's what I would say. We are all born sinners, every single one of us. Um, we all have an equal playing field in that regard. Each and every one of us are born sinners. Um, uh, and, and so that doesn't mean, though, that it's okay to sin. Um, a, a guy can't say, well, I was born to think that women are attractive and want to have uh, sexual intercourse with every pretty woman I see. And since I was born that way, that means it's okay. That argument doesn't hold up. Um, that would be socially unacceptable and, 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 and morally unacceptable and biblically unacceptable. Um, and so just because you may or may not be born a certain way doesn't mean that it would validate that behavior. That being said, I don't believe that she was born gay. Um, I believe that possibly she has a disposition um, men, may, like some people might have a disposition to, um, to alcoholism or different things like that, but um, it's the actual question of was she born that way, I, I, I hesitate to answer that, but I would, my personal belief would be uh, no. Um, but I don't think that it gets them, I don't, I don't think it, it gets her, um, I don't think it's a free pass even if it were proven that she were. Does that make sense? Um, is she still a Christian? Um, it's a, a loaded question, um, and so I'll, or I'll answer it this way. Um, I don't know. And the fact that I don't know um, is scary to me. Um, I believe that when you accept Jesus into your life and he you confess him as your Lord and your Savior, um, I believe that at that point, he changes our hearts. And from that point forward, we no longer um, accept our sin, but we struggle with sin. None of us are perfect, um, but now that Jesus is the ruler of our life, uh, we're now going to battle with sin. And when we do sin, it's going to hurt us, and it's going to it, we're going to feel that, and it's going to it's going to damage the relationship that we have with our Savior. And we're going to try to get better. It's going to be uh, a fight. Uh, it's going to be a struggle. We will struggle with sin. Um, when you no longer struggle with sin and you, and you accept that sin to be a part of your lifestyle and it's not something you wish to change, I think that you've got a big problem. And so as far as my sister's salvation is concerned, I would say that there's a big question mark. I don't know. And that scares me. Nice job with some, some very difficult questions. Um, Steve, just real fast, uh, someone was asking if you have a blog or a website they can go to read some of your other writings or different things that, uh, that you're a part of. Well, sure, there's, there's uh, Facebook, facebook.com slash Human Life International. HLI.org is our website. We also have a, a website where we do a little bit more in the direction of think pieces, though it also intersects with blog. It's the truthandcharityforum.org. 
and we have some terrific writers who contribute there. Very good, thank you. Betty, I haven't forgotten about you. Here's this one's for you. How do you think that we as young adults can best influence our peers in support of traditional families? I think the best way is just by living it out. Um, not arrogantly, but with humility and seeking help, being willing to ask other people to mentor you and to help you. And that, that would be my best. I, I, to proselytize, I don't know that that's going to, uh, you know, you can certainly share your beliefs and your convictions, but I think the best testimony that you're going to have is to live it out in your own life and to be uncompromising. You know, one of the, the issues that I see a lot of times is that we have compromised so much in our behaviors that there's not a lot of distinction between those people of faith and the, and the people in, of, in the world. They don't see a lot of difference. And so I think that I would challenge you to look at your behaviors and what are you doing it may not be sinful, it may not necessarily be wrong, but does it, give you, does it give the right testimony to other people that you're different and that you're going to stand by different standards and you're going to live a different way? Very good. Um, I'm going to open this up to uh, anyone who would like to answer on the panel. Um, we've had several questions, um, and so I'm going to sort of paraphrase um, the best I can. Most of us in this room would agree that our culture here in America is headed uh, in the direction we don't wish it to go. So here's the question. How bad is it going to get? So don't all jump in at once. Pass. This, <laughs> this I, I is think, for anyone. I mean, I Andrew? Think, I mean, I think that it's going to get very bad. Um, short, of massive, short of mass repentance, reformation, and revival. And I think we, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, the various things that have been asked on this panel, I mean, I think it's, in, in Great Britain, on many of our campaigns, on the redefinition of marriage, it was headed up in sort of secular sounding language uh, in the main, but it failed, nonetheless. And there's a sense in which, um, who's God got to use to call a nation back? It's only his people. It's only his people that understand the way to live, the true way to live. He has the blueprint for living. And he calls us, first of all, to repent for when we have not spoken. And then to live out the lives of chastity that we've been called to here. But can I just say, yes, we have to live it out. But unless we also speak it out, how will the people know? And unless we also learn to speak it out to our culture, how are they going to know? But it is right that we have, we have so compromised our own behavior and we have been so silent that we're not distinct anymore. And we are also very fearful of the culture. And we very often try to make ourselves kind of seem like the culture because if we sort of just seem like the culture, then maybe we'll be attractive. But I should tell you what's really attractive? It's the radical, turned around, repentant, reformed life that's following Jesus Christ in purity and chastity and holiness and that's pointing people to the city on the hill that's actually restoring a culture that's under his lordship in the end. And you know, at the moment, it looks like Satan's got the whole, but we know who wins in the end. And I think that we need to remember that. And whilst there is still a remnant, and we've got 3,000 people here. You know, the Lord can turn around nations with 3,000 people. There's enough people here to turn around every country, every nation in this world. <laughs> Um, but it's as if the church is on mute. It, it really is as if we're on mute. So we've got to find, we've got to find our voice. It's good. It's good. <laughs> what she said. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a great, great answer. I'm, I'm going to go to um, Chad because um, he has like 29 children. Um, in the opinion of the panel, which the panel is you for the moment, how can we involve and allow free thinking with our children in the pro-life and pro-family debate without allowing, quote, the other side, unquote, to influence them? 
Well, I have four children, to be clear, which is pretty good for Utah. Uh, uh, it's a great question uh, because developing opinion is something that has to happen individually. Um, and I think as parents and as future parents, the challenges that you're going to face, the challenges that we face now, uh, are only going to get worse. I agree. Unless, unless there are voices that do stand up uh, for what is right and for what God's Word says. I, I think the challenges that you have in front of you uh, are large. And the influence is going to be uh, greater, I believe, uh, for your generation uh, than, uh, than any generation before. Uh, and so it's a difficult question, and I think the, the simple answer, and, and I guess the best way I know how to sidestep that question is this, uh, is to say that as parents, it's your responsibility to teach truth. Uh, the Bible says train a child in the way that they should go. Uh, and so, while that's not a promise, there, there's a word that really is important there, and that's the word train. And, and if you don't do the job of training, someone will. Uh, someone will give them information. Someone will uh, help form their worldview and their perspective on uh, every issue that they're going to have to deal with in their lifetime. Uh, and you want to put yourself in a position where those thoughts uh, and those perspectives uh, are framed by uh, what God's Word says uh, and not by what the world's standard might be. Very good. I'm going to let you uh, answer one quick extra point to that because it's, it's, uh, it's been asked several times and, and it might fall into the same category. Um, the question is on homeschooling. And because uh, and I know you personally, uh, uh, I know that uh, you guys have, have done both worlds, public and, and uh, homeschooling. Um, it was asked several times, but I'm going to read this one. How can we help people understand that homeschooling is a viable option for educating their children? I'm going to pass. <laughs> Go for it, Debbie. Or Betty. Can you repeat the question? How, how can we say that homeschooling is a Yeah, how can option? we help people understand that homeschooling is a viable option? Um... I think you just do it. If you're going to be homeschooling, you just do it. Um, we've been through the gamut of every possible stereotype that you can imagine. Some of those are well-deserved stereotypes. Most of them are not. Um, but I think one of the things that um, I can remember when we started homeschooling, and it was basically unheard of at the time, is that people thought if you were homeschooling that, that you weren't going to educate your children. And I think that when they started realizing that, oh my goodness, they know how to read and write and do math, it was an amazing epiphany. And so I think that maybe just affirming and saying, you know, what other homeschoolers are able to do. You know, one of the interesting things is that one of my concerns when we first started homeschooling was I didn't know what would happen when our, when our oldest child got to college age. I didn't know if he would be able to go to college. And now, Every college prefers, I mean, you get preferential treatment if you homeschool. They, they will waiver certain requirements for homeschoolers. And so that's one of the things that you can just tell people that, you know, you cite the statistics of what the percentages are of students that go to different colleges that are now homeschooled. Very good. trying to figure out if I want to ask this question. I'm going to ask it to, uh, to, to anyone, and, and again, I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. Um, number one, how badly uh, is pornography affecting our nation? And two, if someone close to you said that they are addicted to pornography, what are some practical ways that you can help them and not enable? I might, might give that a shot. Um, it, it says something that there are European countries who are 
actually looking, European progressive countries who are looking to ban pornography. It's the point now where the research is getting so strong that it, it is such, we, we would call it a destroyer of the soul. Um, but a lot of the data points to things that just not, not only destroy marriages, but destroy every effective aspect of a person. That, that the secular world is now considering banning this tells us something about how far it's gone. This isn't anymore just about you know, prude Christians who are afraid of sexuality. And I mean, you still hear that nonsense once in a while, but I think more and more people realize that it is, it is such a dead end. It is so destructive. It is, it is, it's, it's actually closer to the root of a lot of the problems that we're talking about here than a lot of us realize. And because it happens, some people try to popularize it. You know, Fifty Shades of Grey came out a while ago. And then the stars of the movie started fighting in public about how terrible the experience was. You can't hide this stuff forever. The truth will come out about it. So that it's coming out is, is a good thing, um, even if we're not all the way there yet. What can a person do? There's, there's now several ministries, lots of Christian ministries that I'm aware of. Um, I'm on stage, so I can't think of a name um, right now. I'm not, not ready. Uh, and searching pornography on your browser does bad things ads that come onto your you know, browser after that. So look up purity, um, healing. Um, there are some groups, you guys? Triple X Church, don't you? Triple X Church. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's serious. What, what, what they all seem to have in common is that there's an accountability factor. For guys especially, you, you, you started this in private, and you have to come out of it in community to some extent. Prayer is essential. Rebuilding a relationship with God and truth is essential, as is accountability from somebody else that you can trust. So the resources are there, and uh, it's, I think it's getting easier all the time to find ones that, where people can actually get help. And I know it's not just men, um, but those are just the ones that I've heard. Okay. Any other thoughts? Um, yeah, there, I mean, there are good resources. Uh, I think someone actually set out a Triple X Church, which is where we would send most people who struggle uh, there's some really, really good resources uh, as far as the step back to uh, getting back into a right, really, mindset uh, when it comes to, to, to sex and, uh, and what pornography does. Uh, we talked about the studies that are, are now <laughs> everywhere uh, that talk about what it does psychologically, uh, what it does to people emotionally. Uh, it is... It, it really is a dangerous thing. Uh, it's not just Christians that are saying it anymore, uh, which is true. And so I really believe, and I, I would encourage, I, if you've got someone close to you uh, and they've come out and actually expressed that they have a struggle, uh, which is really the biggest and, and the most important step is that first step. Uh, sin holds its greatest hold on us when it's in the dark, when it's in secret. And so when that gets exposed, uh, now you put people around them, uh, ask to be that person they can be accountable to, uh, and hold them accountable, help them work through those issues on their computer uh, and get the right protections there so that they can, they can make that road uh, to recovery. Very good. We only have time for probably uh, two, maybe three questions. Um, so uh, if you haven't texted in already, 801 613 2076. Um, get them in and uh, thank you for all your questions. Um, uh, there's been a lot. And so I, I hope uh, if, if I didn't get to yours specifically, hopefully it, it glanced on the topic a little bit at the very least. Um, again, this is uh, open for anyone in the panel. How do you protect your loved ones from negativity when you have chosen to be an outspoken advocate? Great question. I'll tell my, pers I'll tell my personal story on, on this one. Um, I, when I started doing this work, um, I became very involved in parliamentary briefings when I had two, two small children, and uh, two girls and uh, under two. Um, but it meant that I was at home base at that point. I, my, my, my position in my chambers was reserved, um, but I was based at home. And I began, this was a time when um, legis um, legislation that was really um, uh, liberalizing um, on the whole um, 
marriage issue was coming into play. And I began to write briefings into Parliament. I then had another child. Um, but after that, Luca, my son, I was about to go back to my chambers. Uh, when I fell pregnant, it was, this was a surprise with number four. And um, I do know how babies are made, but it was, it was, a, surprise, uh, it was a surprise to us. When um, I said to my husband, Gareth, that um, I was pregnant, he said, that's because the Lord wants you exactly where you are. Now, and at that moment, I knew that I would never go back to the bar and be the criminal fam family barrister and the judge and the head of chambers that I wanted to be. And, you know, the thing was, I was skipping back to chambers because it was going to be so much easier than being in this fight. And I love being in chambers. But at that moment, when I knew that I was pregnant with fourth child and the Lord was keeping me in this work, in this specific work, um, I knew that God would cover the baby. She's a public policy baby. She's now 13. My children age from 13 to 20. And I think there's a sense in which when you are in this space, your life is committed, all our lives should be committed to the Lord. But if you step out, it's a life of faith and you are in his hands and he covers you. And you then, and you will know that if, he's good, if he covers you, then he's going to cover your family. Now, if I were to abandon them completely and never be at home, um, that would be a terrible thing. I've still got to be their mother, but they've had an unusual mother. An unusual, I've not been a homeschool mother. I've not been at home as I should, but I love those babies. And I want them to love the Lord more than anything else. And I want to grow up in, them to grow up knowing and loving him and knowing that their mum stood uh, for him and for truth in the public space. And I think that's just part of it. I think part of it is you've got to, if you love him, and if you love his truth, then you will love them. And he'll give you your unique situation to love your family in. And then he covers you. And you've got to believe that. And it's the faith walk, and it's the truth walk. And you know what? It's the only place to be. It's the best place to be. But it is a great... It's a, great, it's a life of trust and a life of being in his hands, being held in his hands. That's great. That's great. <laughs> so, so we're going to finish up with this. Um, we, we got some questions um, pertaining to uh, the next generation. And... Uh, Oh, I did, I did forget. I was going to ask this before. Um, I want to ask you two questions. One that was asked a few minutes ago, um, and I didn't get it in. Um, how many of you are homeschooled or were homeschooled? How, how many of you liked it? Just kidding. You don't have to answer. <laughs> um, how many of you are under the age of 30? Woo. Okay. <laughs> so with that in mind, panel. Um, and I need your 90-second answer. What would you, if you just have just 90 seconds, to inspire, correct, uh, challenge this generation, how do you use that 90 seconds? What do you say? We're going to start all the way down at the other end. We'll work this way. Betty, how do you, well, what do you say to this generation? What I would say to you is what I would say to everybody and what I think people tend to do at the last instead of the first. And that is we tend to think we know what we're doing or we tend to have an idea. And so we come to God with that perspective or we come to life with that perspective. And I would counsel you to come to God with an open mind and an open heart and say, God, what is it that you see? What is it that you want me to know? And reveal in me those things that need to change. And allow God to reveal that to you and allow him to use other people to tell you things that maybe you don't want to hear. Um, I think it was A.W. Tozer that said, seek the truth from wherever it comes. That's good. Don't be afraid. Um, especially men, we're fighters. We're not, 
we, we love, we, we, we trust, we, we have to be trustworthy. We have to be worthy of love, which also takes a lot of lack of fear, but, um, but fight. Don't be afraid. And somewhere I hope in this room or somewhere in your network, there is a, a Mark Zuckerberg of why the L LGBT narrative is actually not about human flourishing. Who can say that in a loving, funny, uh, break through the narrative kind of way? Because, because it's the truth. And, I, and you're the ones we have to talk to. And so, yeah, don't be afraid. Uh, I would say this, in front of the biggest obstacles you face is the opportunity for God to have the greatest victory. And uh, I would take it as uh, a personal, if I sat where you sat today, I would take it as a personal compliment from God that he trusts you this much. Uh, because you're facing some pretty big obstacles. And you've got an opportunity uh, to allow God's word and what God would want uh, to come and rise above all of that. Uh, and so I, I think you are in a position of having a, a massive compliment from God, uh, and, and I would encourage you to not waste it. Um, I would say that our calendar is, um, is founded on the, the death and life of Jesus. And he used 12 people to change the world. Um, and those 12 people were younger than most of you. You are not the future leaders, you are the leaders. Um, and he's put it on your shoulders. And uh, run with that. Be the change that you want to see. Speak out. Be confident um, in love. We, you, have an, you have an amazing opportunity um, to, to look at somebody in the eye and say, you know what? I love you. I love you so much. I love you too much to lie to you. Um, and I believe that, that when the young people um, rise up and stand on biblical truth and, uh, and go where, where God is leading you, um, I believe that that's where we see some real change. When we love like Jesus loved, when we speak truth like he spoke, um, when we care like he cared, when we are his hands and his feet, and he used young people in the past, and he used young, and he's using young people now, um, we tend to be his vessels and his and, and, and the, the ones that he uses the most. And so, own that, accept that, be challenged by that, encouraged by that. And every single day, wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, "I am his hands and I am his feet, and I will go out and I will spread the love and the truth of my Lord and Savior." It is to humble yourself before him. He who wants to win the world for Jesus Christ must be prepared to come into conflict with the world. We are to be worshipful warriors, changed people in Jesus Christ, change cultures. You are the future, you will change your culture. It is to fear God, to fear God and not man, to not seek the favor of man. You know, people across the world are dying because they love Jesus Christ. Even today, people have died. And we're scared, we're scared of the Twitter feed. I'm scared of the Twitter feed. Okay? So it's um, fearing God and not man. Uh, Love him, love others. And remember that to lead is to serve. To lead is to serve. God bless you all and may you really be changed people that change your cultures because it starts from here. This is where truth is found. You just give all of our panelists a big thank you. So hopefully, very, 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 very,
Hopefully you have been, uh, enjoyed the time. Remember, ask God to reveal his truth and wisdom. You don't be afraid. See victory through God through the obstacles you're facing. Do not waste the opportunity that he's given you. Be the change you want to see. Lead in love. Fear God, not man. Seek God's favor alone. To lead is to serve and do everything in love. So have an incredible, incredible night, incredible rest of the week. Welcome to Salt Lake City. Hope you've enjoyed it.